Thanks, and welcome everybody. So, maturing your platform engineering initiative. So, my name is Nikki Watt. I'm the CEO and CTO at a company called Open Credo. We're based out of London uh, in the UK. And we, uh, we're a hands-on software development consultancy, and we help our clients to build sort of cloud-native architectures, data platforms, and one of the key areas that we work in is around platform engineering. So um, what I'm going to do today is speak to you about some of the experiences that we've had in trying to help our different clients mature their platform engineering initiatives, um, but also have a look at it from how can the CNCF maturity model actually help with that. So there's some, some of the experiences that we've kind of worked with, different types of clients, and I'm going to try and pull on some of those in order to, to, to tell the story. So in terms of what we're going to cover, we're going to start off just with a bit of an introduction, have a look at what is the platform maturity model, platform engineering maturity model, and then go into the main part, which will be around the sort of typical scenarios and journeys that we see our clients going through, and then to finish off with some key lessons, takeaways, and a conclusion. So first of all, what is, like, where did this platform maturity model come from? So I haven't made this up. Um, this was actually originally donated by uh, the good people at uh, Sintasso um, and the wonderful Abby Bankser actually leading the charge there. And um, I did help to contribute to some of the sort of the precursor uh, to being donated to the CNCF. And so I'm going to try and give our view on how this fits with how we do things. But essentially, it was donated to the CNCF. And then in um, November 2023, it was actually released uh, in the first version. I think Colin from the, the working group, the platform working group, actually spoke about a little bit about that um, early on. So I've got the, the sort of URL there. So if you want to um, have a look at it, please do either Google it or, or go to that URL. Uh, in the slides uh, moving forward. But let's dive into the model uh, and just kind of have a look what is this, uh, what is the actual sort of model. So at its heart, I'd say it's really a, it's sort of a, a collation of trying to find the sort of patterns and wisdoms that various people have gone through to try and sort of put together in a handy matrix style sort of um, setup and show the different sort of characteristics and the different sort of, um, sort of practices that exist at different levels of maturity as people go through this, uh, this process. It'll hopefully also provide you with a, a way to sort of orient yourself, so where am I in this, this particular process, and also highlight like what maybe are the limitations for where I am and what are the opportunities for where I can move to. Now, this is not meant to be dogmatic, so there may well be sections that don't apply to you, and it's really meant to be you kind of take the pieces that work, maybe even add some in, but it's trying to give you a framework to be able to do this. But at a high level, there's these two angles. You've got the aspects that you want to kind of look at, and then you've got the maturity level. So if we start off with the aspects, one of the first one that, that is kind of looked at is around investment. And this is really around how are the staff and the funds sort of allocated to platform capabilities. So you may find if you're in an organization, it may come from the sort of grassroots to get people that are starting to try and uh, cajole it forward. And then it may also come from the top down. But no matter sort of which way you, you sort of come about it, making sure that you have the right funding and the people available at the right time to, to, to progress your initiatives will be really key to making sure that uh, you can actually um, progress forward. So optimizing for the time, the people, and the sort of money is really going to be crucial to moving forward. So this aspect, we'll have a look at that. Then you've got the adoption. And this looks at how and why do users actually sort of discover the, your platform and the sort of platform capabilities that you have. So um, not... We basically want a, we want a platform that users actually want to use. We don't want something that is, is non-sort of desirable. So one of the things that we want to do here is really kind of find out, you know, where are users on this journey? So in some cases, you might have users that they, they don't even know they have a platform. They just have a collection of sort of um, common tooling, or maybe on the one sort of end. But as you mature along, you'll find that actually there's more of that curated experience that Matthew Skelton kind of speaks about. And you've got these different sort of levels that, that people kind of work within. And you know, on the one end, you might also have users that are more kind of uh, forced onto the platform. And then on the other end, you've got users that really sort of self-serve. They want to be there. And they're actually trying to, to um, encourage uh, users, other users to get on, but also to contribute back to the system. So that's on the adoption aspect. Interface-wise, this looks at what's the maturity around how your users actually interact with and consume the platform capabilities. 
So with this, you're really kind of looking at interfaces which look at things like provisioning, the managing, and maybe the sort of observability of, of some of the, the capabilities that you're looking at. And on the one end, you might have things where there's ticketing systems. It's actually quite manual. So the systems that you interact with are very manual. They take quite a long time. Maybe even portals that don't have APIs. But then as you mature along the, the, the sort of spectrum, you get to more API-driven setups, more CLI type of, of setups. And this will have a look at sort of where you are on that, on that spectrum. Operation-wise, this looks at how are the platforms and their capabilities actually planned, prioritized, and maintained. Now, from this perspective, um, if you think about it, uh, it's, there's a saying which goes, you know, a dog is not just for Christmas, it's for life. And it's the same thing when it comes to platforms. You don't just uh, kind of build a platform and it's only for a day one capability. You really need to have a look at what is, the, what is the operational aspect moving forward. And this aspect will have a look at that. So this will include things like how do, you, how do you deal with your users when you need to upgrade the platform or the, the, the capabilities around it, or you need to create new features? What does that look like, and how sort of consistent is it? And this is looked at throughout the whole life cycle. And the final one is really around measuring it. So how, what is the actual process that you go through for gathering and incorporating feedback and, 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 and learning from it? So as the saying goes, if you can't measure it, it generally sort of doesn't exist. So how will you know if you're maturing if you don't have those feedback loops that are kind of coming into, into you and, and getting uh, the feedback from your users? So this aspect will have a look at things like, do you have explicit or implicit um, feedback loops coming in? But also not just that, it's about the actual quality and how consistent is it as you get up the more sort of mature level of the, of the spectrum uh, to, to, to where you're going. So that's really around the aspects. So these are different kind of things that we have a look at. Then you have the maturity levels themselves. And this is generally sort of labeled from sort of one to four, um, with some kind of descriptions for the titles here. But the key thing to note is that there's no sort of single standalone definition which says this is what it means to be provisional. You generally need to have a look at it in the context of the aspect that you're actually looking at. So what will typically be is you'll find there's more tactical type of characteristics and, and outcomes that you find on the sort of left-hand side, and then as you progress to the right, it's a little bit more um, strategic. Now, this doesn't mean that if you find yourself in level one or two of a particular aspect that that's bad. It just means that you know, maybe you're at a place where um, you, know, you need to have a particular tactical setup in order to progress forward. So it's really more about where you are and how you, know, how you can improve moving forward. So I'm not going to go through all of the details here because we'd be here for a very long time. Uh, but you can go to the, um, the, the, the CNCF and actually have a look at this. They've got this available in a PDF. And I would advise you to go and do that. What is worth noting, however, is that as you are looking to mature your platform engineering initiative, the more levels, the more sort of maturity levels that you want to go up, you need to be aware that you are going to need greater funding and you are going to read, need more of people's time in order, to, in order to move forward. And practically, that means that you may not want to automatically aim for being at level four everywhere. You need to be sort of pragmatic and say, what is it that um, what are the constraints that me and my business has in terms of where I am, in terms of, of people and time, and then work within that. So this actually fits in nicely with there was a, a, the panel which spoke about build versus buy. And there's a lot of you know, different ways of cutting the sort of costs and things. And, and this is a, an angle which would, uh, you can have a look at. So let's recap. What is the point of this maturity model? Is it to get some kind of comparative score, like I'm a 3.5 out of 5? Absolutely not. Um, is it to find the one true way for how you actually kind of mature your platform engineering initiative? Absolutely not. Uh, there are many ways to do this. But really what it's about is trying to provide a helpful way for you to really understand what are the outcomes, what are the practices that exist at different maturity levels in these different aspects? Where are you currently? And also then, what are the limitations and the opportunities that exist for you to, to mature and move forward? So, oh, and finally, also to cement the idea, if you have a look at all of these different characteristics, that the, the, the real way to get a, a good outcome is to make sure that you balance your people process and technology uh, alongside, um, uh, alongside your technology. So that was the, the sort of platform uh, engineering maturity model. 
Now we're going to have a look at the typical scenarios and the journeys that uh, we go on. So here are some common scenarios. Um, or we have customers that come with many different reasons for why they want to mature their platform engineering initiatives. And you know, um, th there's a variety of them, and I'm not going to be able to sort of explore all of them. But we're going to explore one or two of them. But what I would say is that irrespective of the scenario that you start with, I would, there's a couple of key kind of points that are common across everything when you're getting started. And the first one is that you really need to understand what are your ultimate goals and what are the constraints that you're working within. So this is really important because um, what it essentially means is that you want to have a look at what are your main business drivers. So am I trying to scale my organization within a particular point in time? Or am I trying to migrate off some legacy technology? Because depending on where you start, or depending on what your main drivers are, uh, you may land up going and trying to end in, in a particular sort of different place. And you can have multiple. There may be sort of a mixture of these. But you want to uh, make sure that you can figure out what are the strategies that I need. So once you've done that, you then need to say, OK, I know where I'm going, but where am I at this point in time? So you need to understand what your landscape is. So you need to try and plot yourself as best as you can sort of in this, this matrix to see you know, where am I. Now, it's not necessarily going to be perfect, and you probably won't find that you fit nice and neatly into a category, and that's OK. You can even add extra categories in there. So for example, uh, one of the things that might come up is you might have ESG as, a, a, as another sort of category. So different teams, different customers will have slightly different things, but this matrix does give a good indication of what the main uh, sort of aspects are to consider. And finally, once you, you, know, you know, OK, this is where I've started, this is where I'm ending, you then want to sort of plan and say, OK, what are, what are my particular steps that I need to take in order to go from where I am to where I want to be? And you always want to aim to take sort of baby steps and um, iterate and then rinse, repeat as you go along. Because a lot of this process may be experimental to a certain extent. You may not know exactly what's going to work. So if you do sort of little and often, it's much easier to be able to work out whether things are working, if you've got a good feedback mechanism, uh, than trying to do everything in a big bang. OK, so this is a scenario that comes up quite often when uh, clients approach us. And there's a desire to improve a particular technology. So they want to improve their Kubernetes platform. But I would argue that this is not a business driver. This is a desire to improve technology. And when, when clients come to us, we generally need to dig a little bit deeper and say, well, what, what is actually the reason behind you wanting to improve your Kubernetes platform? And then you kind of get into the scenarios where they say, well, actually, the developers are overloaded, and they can't develop fast. And you say, OK, well, that's, that's the reason. That's what we actually need to optimize for, not just Kubernetes per se. And that's why the title of the talk is also about you know, trying to go beyond just Kubernetes. It's to Kubernetes and beyond. So we want to have a look not just at the technology, but at the overall sort of aspects in order to mature our platform engineering initiatives. So Kubernetes will be a key part of it, but not the main thing. So the scenario we're going to spend a little bit more time on in this talk is around um, scaling an enterprise, what I call center of excellence. So the scenario is that we want to sort of grow and we need to scale. We also want to sort of deliver a little bit faster and more effectively. Now this could be, you could, your starting point could be a startup actually, but, and that will have a very different starting point and a different end point than if you're an enterprise. But we're going to focus on the enterprise one from this perspective. So what does that look like? So the first thing, as we said, what we want to know is what are our particular ultimate goals, what are the constraints that we are working with? So in an enterprise center of excellence, we would, we'd kind of say, all right, in this particular case, we, want, we have some key business expansion that we're trying to do. Um, we probably need to onboard uh, maybe another sort of 20 plus teams. Maybe that is as a result of some mergers and acquisitions. And it'll probably scale up even more after that. But in the initial phases, we need to onboard, say, another 20. And we've got sort of 12 to 18 months to do this. And maybe we probably need to con conform with some uh, sort of security regulations as we go along as well. So we say, OK, the, the main thing is the scaling as well as trying to go fast. So we, we are generally aiming to be in the sort of scaling um, uh, maturity angle, but we'll see as how we go along. So where are we? Now we get to the point where, OK, we need to actually kind of plot ourselves. 
So this is where if you're looking at the, the platform engineering maturity model, you would go to it and you'd kind of have a look at the description and maybe the sort of example scenarios and the characteristics and try and plot, as I say, as best you can where you think you belong. What we have found as a, a sort of a typical setup, and this is not necessarily always the case, but often an enterprise that is, you know, they have a platform team, sorry, uh, and in an enterprise center of excellence scenario, your people will generally have uh, central funding. So there is a team already, or it's maybe called a center of excellence, and there is central funding, but it's often treated as a cost center at this point in time. You'll generally have people that are actually dedicated to trying to provide common tools, but it's mostly going to actually be your technology folk that are, are doing things. You won't necessarily have a lot of other, maybe sort of product uh, type folk in there as well. So, so all right, this is maybe where we are from an investment perspective uh, in, a, in this particular scenario. What about the adoption? So, when it comes to enterprises, um, one of the things we find quite often is that there's very much a, a sort of an imperative and a directive for users to get onto the platform. There's generally some um, uh, sort of, uh, as I say, directives which will say you need to use this particular type of uh, framework or this particular setup, and the users don't generally have the choice as to whether they want to be on the platform or not, but they're, they're kind of forced into it. And Sorry, and another characteristic uh, that we found with uh, enterprise uh, center of excellence type setups is that uh, you often have a wiki, so people have actually got a lot of documentation out there and say this is exactly how you, um, you, you adopt the platform, but it's often not out of, it's often, often out of date and it doesn't actually sort of keep up. So this is a typical kind of setup. Interface wise, this is a bit of a mixed bag. You can sometimes have a, um, uh, you know, sort of standard tooling there, but it's not necessarily set up in a way that uh, it allows you to be consistent. So it's semi-consistent. Typical sort of characteristics here is that you'll find uh, the, the interfaces that are provided will focus on things like bootstrapping. So it's like, how do I get people maybe onboarded fast, but then once they're actually up to speed, there's not necessarily the sort of ability to carry on in, a, in an automated and a consistent way after that. So um, that is uh, on the interfaces. In terms of the operations, and again, this is not exactly uh, the, the case for everybody, but we have found that with many of the enterprises, operations tends to be one of the areas which is a little bit less um, mature, uh, and it's, it tends to happen more sort of by request and in a reactive manner rather than um, sort of uh, proactively. So what you will typically find, or what we've typically found when we've, when we've worked with these type of setups is that the focus is really on the sort of day one requests and not so much on the day two requests. So a good sort of example of this is if you have, um, so you may discover a vulnerability in your setup, um, or maybe actually you've got a, um, uh, an operating system that needs upgrading. So you'll know your different sort of teams that are out there, and you'll say, okay, we've got, we've got 20 or so teams already, um, and we know that they need upgrading, but you won't have the capability as a platform team to actually be able to do that. You'll need to kind of schedule that onto their backlog and get them to actually uh, do it for you. So that means it's more kind of by request than, than actually sort of centrally tracked. And finally, um, how many? So we've also got on the measurement side of things. So this can be, generally there might be some measurement, but it's generally some sort of basic technical setups. It's not necessarily stuff that is customer focused and, and user centric at this place, at, at this stage. So there may be initial surveys that are done, but if they are done, they tend to be a little bit more sort of custom and, and a once-off type thing, but there's not a, a consistent, a consistent uh, measurement at this particular point in time. So we say, okay, this is a rough sort of um, indication of where a, an enterprise might be. Let's have a look, how do we move forward? So what we will typically do if we go into a, a, a client is to lay the foundation for building what I'd say the right thing and not just anything. And that means that we want to kind of look at certain kind of key areas that will really help us to make a difference moving forward. And one of the first things that that will be will be in the investment uh, sort of area. So with this one, we, if we're going to scale up to, to multiple teams, you definitely need more funding. So if you don't already have C-level buy-in, that is generally something that uh, it needs to be part of this. 
But also the key area here is that we need to move from a project type mindset to a more customer focused and more platform as a product type mindset. And we've spoken a lot about that uh, sort of moving forward as well. And Practically, what that will also mean is that um, some, of the t some of the members of the team that will actually sort of be part of, of, your, uh, of your platform team will, will differ. So now you might actually get some platform, or some, some, sorry, some product managers type uh, involved as well. And this is, this is going to be a little bit different. So, and, and you actually could have moved to a, a profit center model as well. So these, these extra people are also going to help us to be able to advance some of the other aspects that we have uh, looking at as well. So once we've set that in place, so we've got our funding, we've got a few more product and customer centric um, types in our team, we then want to have a look at the measurements. So how, we're not going to know how we're advancing if we, if we can't measure it. And what we want to move to, if you're in the ad hoc space, is at least get to some what I call reliable, um, reliable intel. And this is where you can use some of these new roles that people have come in with, so maybe the product managers and the researchers, to be able to design you some quali qualitative research surveys. So what, how are your users actually using the platform and are they, you know, are they able to um, uh, progress as things move along? So it's not just going to be a once-off thing. You design this so that you can work out if you're actually progressing. You do the same uh, on the operational side. Make sure you move to a more sort of centrally tracked setup. And um, uh, yeah, to a more centrally tracked setup. And this will be maybe to the point where you have you may not have, it may not be manual, sorry, it may not be automated at this stage, but you do want to understand what is my estate, what do I have, who's responsible for what, so that I can actually know how I, how I move, move, move forward. So making sure that you have this, this sort of central, centralized documentation of where you have will allow you to then automate and move things forward. Don't forget to do your technical due diligence. So when we, when we go into our clients, we will often um, actually in, uh, do a lot of technical due diligence as part of this. So have a look specifically at the architecture, the observability, automation, and infrastructure as part of this. So the things I had spoken about previously weren't very, they weren't necessarily that technical, but don't forget that this is a key part of what needs to be done. And the reason I say this, a good example here, is if you kind of look at different multi-tenancy models. So if you're trying to scale your organization up to sort of 20 plus teams, the decisions that you make here technically can have a big impact on the sort of size and complexity of the operational setup that you're trying to do moving forward. So you want to be able to make sure that your technical people and your business and ops people all work together to make sure that you can come up with an optimal solution. So as I noted before, um, you know, you try and do your best to plan and move along. And what you'll find is that you'll make a lot of progress on all of these aspects, but the one you'll struggle with will be adoption. And this um, is because we found that even if you make various sort of good sort of technical, um, challenge, uh, make technical progress along the way, there are certain things which just act as a barrier to adoption. And these are some of the ones that we have found. So the first one is a lack of confidence. So what we found is that if you go into an organization, you've done things, but the, the developers are still not adopting. And, it, and quite often it will be because they're just not confident that the platform is actually going to be able to support them when it goes into production. Or maybe they're the first ones going into production and they're just not, they're, they're not actually happy with that. Or they're not comfortable with that. The other thing that is also a drag is that there's not enough features. So they may need like a database and a queue and you've only given them a few things. And so they're like, oh, if I don't have all of my pieces, I'm, I'm not going to go. And so this is why it's important to make sure that when you choose the, the teams that you want to progress through as your first sort of exemplars, that you find ones that are champions, but also ones that uh, can take you all the way through the system so that you will be able to learn about the operational aspects and give confidence for others as you go forward. And also, finally, you need to make sure about the um, developer relations. Uh, so we found this is really important. So evangelizing to the developers about the platform and how they can use it is really important to getting them to adopt and become more sort of self-selecting rather than having the, the stick approach, which is what is typically happens in an enterprise center of excellence. So 
that was a little bit of a whistle-stop tour in terms of what it might look like in a, an enterprise center of excellence type of setup. But as I said before, it's not going to be a big bang, big bang approach. You would typically take little steps along the way on your journey. So there can be a lot of different scenarios out there for why you might want to mature your platform engineering model. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of them, um, unfortunately, due to time. So I'm just going to finish off with um, some key lessons and some takeaways from this. So basically, as part of your sort of strategy for moving towards a more mature platform model or more mature platform, what you really want to do is start with understanding what are your main, what is your ultimate goal that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to scale up? Are you trying to do developer productivity? Or is it something else? Because that is going to inform where you want to get to, but also some of the trade-offs you might need to make along the way. Make sure you know where you're starting from so that you can work out what that gap is. And then do plan baby steps uh, in order to sort of move forward. Try and lay the foundation for some of the other steps that you'll need to take. So things like investment, making sure that you've got the right people in the team will be crucial to getting this right. And then don't forget that this has to all be done um, sort of collectively. So consider people, process, and tech together as part of your decision making. So the conclusion is basically, in addition to the key lessons I've just highlighted, um, the maturity model can be a really helpful way to sort of plan your journey as you are maturing, but it isn't the plan. You will still need to work out for yourself what are the particular steps that I need to take to move from point A to point B, and that is going to be context dependent. As you try and mature your, your, your particular initiative, you will need more investment in people and time the, the more you want to go up those models. But that doesn't mean you always need to aim for everything to be at level four. It will be horses for courses in this case. But whatever strategies and the approaches that uh, you take, you need to just make sure that you balance your people, process, your policy, and your technology. And with that, thank you very much. I don't know if there's time for questions. <laughs> So, questions for Nikki? Any question? Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. What would you consider a rule of thumb of where, when we're talking DIY versus buy in, when we're talking about the platform? Sorry, can you say that again? <clears throat> what would you consider uh, like rule of thumb when mm -hmm. you considering buying or DIYing your platform? Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so I said so one of the one of the angles to have a look at is is generally cost. Like there's not an endless uh, you know sort of monetary supply of of of, uh, of money in any organization. Uh, but also the developers and the skills that they have and the time that you have to be able to uh, to implement your, your 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 setup. So when it comes to build versus buy, it would be a combination of looking at you know, do I have the team and the capability to actually build something brand new? Do I even need that? Or actually, is there something that's out there that I can use that I'll get 80% of what I need? And maybe that's good enough for a starting point. So it really kind of depends on what your particular constraints are. And that's why I say it's really important to understand what it is you're aiming for and, and what the constraints are. So combination of cost, people's um, skills uh, would, be a, would be part of figuring that out. I also have a question. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your talk. Uh, so, what do you think about the buy versus build versus uh, compose? Like, mm -hmm. adopt something. Yep. What's your point of view about that? So, it depends, which is always the consultant's answer. Um, but if I have to, there's not a rule of thumb, but I would generally say um, it, it's, it's customized, basically. It's the sort of Quite often, the, the build will not do everything that you want. You will always have to customize to a certain extent. Um, but building everything from scratch is also like over the top. So there's generally some happy medium, I would say, in the middle. I think the, the key thing, and this has been spoken about by many people before, is to make sure that you do it to APIs. Uh, so that you can uh, you know, adapt different things. So if you're going to buy something, make sure that it has an API and that you can integrate with it from other things, because that gives you flexibility, um, rather than just kind of portals and things. But 
in most of the clients that we're in, there's always a customization that tends to, that tends to happen. It's never just one or the other. Thanks. Hey, what would you advise if a customer comes to you and says that one of their drivers to um, go on with their platform initiative is to streamline the cost profile of the organization or the engineering body? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, cost is, cost is an angle that, that some people sort of come at, but I think there's, there's different ways of, of looking at this. So it kind of sort of digging like what, what aspect is it of the cost that you're after? Because um, there's, different, there's different paths that, that one can sort of take. So is it just to cut costs? Because what you don't want to do is necessarily just, you know, uh, cut the sort of workforce type thing. But there are ways to optimize that. So it's definitely something to look at. Um, and it's a very valid concern, if I'm honest, that, that people generally kind of come with. So. But I wouldn't look at it just in isolation. I would also kind of say, well, what are the other things you're trying to achieve? So there's the cost angle, which is the primary sort of thing, but you don't want to sacrifice some of the other initiatives that you're also looking at. So um, a platform is one of those things that if you get it right, it will allow you to do that. But it's generally not something that happens straight away. It's actually something that takes a little bit of time to get there. So there is initially sometimes an investment that's required. So if people are expecting a, a quick result, that's not necessarily going to help. So the time horizon for when people are trying to actually optimize for cost, they need to have a bit more of a longer term look at. And so that's the one thing we would generally say is, yes, it can come, but it's not going to happen it's not going to happen sort of chop chop. Um, you mentioned about needing buy-in from the C-suite. So how do you get that buy-in in the first place? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, pleading sometimes. Um, so I think sometimes. When, when uh, people come to us, uh, it's all gone horribly wrong. Uh, and there's actually a recognition uh, that it's gone wrong like three or four times already. And so things need to change. And the C-suite has been um, impacted uh, by that and or they actually have, um, th they've recognized the desire. So sometimes, if I'm honest, there, there is, um, the C-suite have actually sort of recognized that. However, when you start with um, organizations where um, the, the initiative starts from the grassroots and then you're trying to actually convince management to take it on, that is far more difficult. And so part of that is to find out like what are their particular, you know, what are their particular challenges. So the type of things that the C-suite often cares about are things like risk, and um, security, and so if you can speak in their language and say, uh, you know, part of this, this platform engineering initiative, we will be able to look at risk and whatever, and in the long run, we'll be able to potentially, you know, reduce, uh, you know, the, the, the risk profile or make things a little bit more streamlined. Those are the type of things that they are generally interested in, but if you just talk about Kubernetes and, you know, this type of stuff, it goes absolutely nowhere. So it's working out what is their challenge and it's spending time with them to find out exactly what is the key driver, you know, and often if you, if you chat with them, you will, you'll, you'll kind of find that out and say, well, actually, this is how the platform can help. But it's been able to kind of map what their challenge is to how the platform uh, will be able to actually help that. OK, thank you very much, Nikki. We have no more time for questions. So a big round of applause for Nikki.